Tushar. It's me sitting in for Solomon Saranja. My name is Mebo Chegumiezake. Thank you so much for continuing to watch NBS television. I never take it for granted that you watch NBS television, and that's why I often say thank you. Why? Because today access comes at a cost, and not only access to watch NBS, but access generally to watch media platforms. Given the COVID-19 times that have affected the different economies throughout the country, you find that words like equal or equity, a divergency, imbalance, they are with us. They've been there for a while, but right now the debate is more pronounced with those words when it comes to equitable distribution of the diag diagnostics, the therapeutics, among other things related to COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, that's the backbone of this discussion this afternoon. As you welcome our guests, so... I do appreciate you for coming, Dr. Dennis Chibide, the Executive Director of Coalition for Health Promotion and Social Development that helps Uganda. It's a leading NGO in advocating for equitable distribution of essential medicines in Uganda. Good afternoon and you're welcome. Good afternoon, Mabel. Okay. Good afternoon, and, viewers. All right. And then a face that is not so new to our viewers, usually here, you visited the Political Command Center before Mr. Moses Mulumba is the Executive Director of SEHAD. SEHAD, to remind you and emphasize, is the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much and good afternoon viewers. Well, okay, that seat is empty, but it's supposed to be for Dr. Driwale Alfred. We introduced him earlier. He's the Assistant Commissioner, Uganda National Expanded Program uh, for Immunization. That is UNEPI, so he will be joining us uh, shortly. And then from the United States, uh, based in Washington, D.C., is going to be joining us on Skype. That is Mr. Zane Rizvi, who is a law and policy researcher, public interest. Uh, well, it's good afternoon this side. We're not sure if it's the same, but of course, you'll be joining the conversation uh, shortly. We did invite uh, the Executive Secretary Registrar uh, from the National Drug Authority, but at the moment... We'll be finding out if he'll be joining us in that chair too. So please join the conversation as we talk about access. And I'll start off with uh, Dr. Dennis Chibida. Right now, after the announcement on the discovery of the COVID-19 vaccine, Pfizer, Moderna, the conversation has changed to who is next in line when it comes to accessing the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. But of course, that is not short of the inaccessibility when it comes to the diagnostics and other therapeutics concerning the COVID-19 pandemic. So please bring it home for us, at, at least coming from an advocacy point of view, the challenges that have been affecting access to the COVID-19 essential medicines. Thank you, Mebo. Uh, good afternoon once again, uh, our viewers. Uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, the pandemic caught all of us, all countries unawares, and it's, it's really shaken up health systems uh, globally. Um, supply chains were hampered across, across the world. We know that borders were closed and therefore transport for essential medicines and commodities became expensive, which made them uh, expensive. We know that some factories actually closed down, uh, which uh, also proved to be problematic. Mm -hmm. And we know if we can also specifically talk about the diagnostics, we've had issues here about the price of, of, of the testing, which has been high. But also globally, um, manufacturers of, of, of these testing kits uh, who also manufacture other kits, mm -hmm. uh, like the malaria kits, the HIV kits, found it more, uh, it was more lucrative to produce these. And, and so they abandoned uh, the, the other testing kits. If you look at uh, uh, issues, for example, uh, personal protective equipment for, uh, uh, for the health workers, this has really been lacking and... Uh, uh, this has been a, gl a global problem. Mm -hmm. You saw in, in one of the bigger countries, uh, one country that hijacked commodities that were meant for, 
for another country. Mm. So what has happened really is that uh, COVID-19 has caused a shortage yeah. of commodities that have been used to, to manage uh, the, the condition and uh, created a panic. Um, mm. So there have also been a trial of various uh, medicines. Uh, remember one medicine, uh, Ramdesava from uh, Gilead Pharma, mm. when they thought that this, this would work, the United States bought up all the stock of, of, of that commodity. Mm. It would not be accessible to others. When uh, another medicine, which is, has been around for many years, dexamethasone, was found to be useful, uh, another country said, we shall not export any of our dexamethasone. Mm. And so there have been such issues. But even before we go to that, uh, this pandemic has impacted all of us really badly. Uh, there are about over 330 million people globally yeah. that have tested positive. This is like, it would be the third biggest country in the world. In the world. A million people have lost their lives. We have also lost dear ones here in Uganda. Sure. Um, but others have also died, not because of COVID, but COVID-related. Mm. Some were not able to access health facilities. Some, I have uh, a colleague I work with who had uh, an hypertensive um, sister, and there was an emergency. This person needed health care. They went to several facilities, but these people at the facilities wanted to have a COVID test mm -hmm. first for someone that needed emergency care. They ended up losing this lady. We know that also the testing sites, uh, mainly in Kampala, maybe in Tebe, and the, just a few other sites outside, mm. concentrated, uh, although their testing is expensive, the concentration is here, and yet we know there is community spread. And mm. therefore the discussion around COVID uh, diagnostics, the testing, uh, the treatments, but also the vaccine no. is very important. I'll go to the vaccine that you've talked about. There are a number of candidate vaccines, but we know now that we have one from Pfizer, we have uh, one from Moderna, and uh, even the AstraZeneca one, the Oxford AstraZeneca one has also proven to be, to be effective. But there are issues around how will this be made accessible? Mm -hmm. We know that uh, it's projected that about 1.3 billion doses will be produced by all these manufacturers within the coming year, but two countries have booked 1.1 doses. So what will the rest of us get? Mm -hmm. uh, even then, when uh, uh, Gavi, the, the, which is, does immunization, related to immunization, and also uh, funding from philanthropists that, like Bill and Melinda Gates, but also WHO, even when they come together mm. to ensure that we have a people's vaccine that could reach us. How will it work? We know that uh, many people are against vaccines, yeah. the vaccine hesitancy. We need to start talking about that in country. We know uh, that the immunization program we have has been for children. Now it has to be changed for adults and for others that uh, may, what, may need this more urgently, the vaccine more urgently. How will this vaccine reach uh, the, the end user? Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are issues we, we need to start discussing as a country to ensure that uh, uh, we are prepared. For example, the cold chain, mm -hmm. the Pfizer uh, vaccine, is supposed to be stored under 85 degrees centigrade. Yeah. How do we have infra infrastructure to enable that? Do we have champions for this to ensure that people can already begin talking about this? Mm -hmm. uh, you already see um, we, they, they, uh, it, it, the, the Minister of Health was on TV yesterday urging all of us Ugandans to, 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 to be more cautious. Uh, uh, the, Uganda, we've been lucky we do not had as many deaths as other countries, mm -hmm. but our testing has also been low. What will happen when we need a lot of hospitalizations? What will happen when 
you know, our health system gets overwhelmed. These are discussions we, we, we need to, to begin to have. Mm. And that's why we're here today. Mm. All right. And mm. you've set the stage very well for this discussion. And as I bring in a human rights act activist, mm. Mr. Mulumba, at the end, especially where he started talking about the two countries, you know, today they are calling it the scramble yeah. for the COVID-19 vaccine. Mm. And you find that if I read something for you here, he mentioned the Pfizer vaccine, which is expected to be the first to receive the Food and Drug Administration authorization in the coming weeks. It said that it expects to produce enough to vaccinate about 12.5 uh, million Americans by the end of 2020. Earlier, I spoke of who is next in line. And Uganda is a, a developing yeah. country, right? Mm. The news of the vaccine was supposed to be good news, but mm. right now it's yeah. turning into the bittersweet yeah. news. Maybe as you bring in the human rights uh, issues, of the implications in terms of the essential medicines related to COVID-19, let's start from the bittersweet uh, thanks a lot. And I think Dennis has done a good job in terms of making a case um, for the vaccines and other things which are critical in COVID-19. Sure. I think we are overly focused on discovery, and that's an important race. Mm -hmm. Everyone is really racing towards, uh, you know, having, being the first to get the, the vaccine. And when the news began to come in, yeah. it became a political discussion. It became um, a conversation of congratulations. But we forget one thing. Which is? That, you know, medicine's discovery is also a commercial thing. Um, two things are very critical to emphasize. Once medicine is discovered, whoever has got it has a right over it. So fine, we will jubilate, uh, we will celebrate, but ultimately we have to look at our systems and our capacity to be able to take on these discoveries uh, mm -hmm. that are being made. I think that from a human rights point of view, yes, access is important, everyone should receive medicines, but the history has demonstrated, especially around HIV AIDS treatment, mm -hmm. that you know, those that have money will access. Those that have the capacity to produce these medicines will access fast. Then the rest will access. At one time, the dose of uh, HIV AIDS treatment was costing over $10,000 um, a year. This has come drastically down. What we are seeing now is not going to be different from what we witnessed in the history. But two things are very important. The first thing, um, as I've indicated, is preparedness um, at a country level. Because if we are relying on other scientists, other actors being the leaders in all of this, uh, it means that we'll certainly have to first sat satisfy them uh, before we get satisfied. There are questions around how we have been prepared uh, for research. Uh, around these areas, how we've been prepared for production around these areas, but also how we have been prepared to be able to take advantage uh, of what is existing. Human rights talks about the right to benefit from scientific progress. And uh, if you're to benefit from scientific progress, you must actually be able to receive treatment uh, on a timely basis when it is out, but also prevention on a timely basis once it is out. The biggest encumbrance in the discoveries of, of, of diagnostics, uh, of, of, of uh, vaccines, at the moment is ownership. Um, and that ownership within the realm of law is protected. If, for instance, someone comes up with a vaccine now, that vaccine is going to receive a legal shield that we call a patent. A patent is protecting anyone um, protecting the person who has discovered from anyone in terms of interfering with the product that they have uh, 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 discovered. So you can't sell, you can't import, you can't make use of, and you can't really play around with someone's patent. So if Pfizer today discovers uh, a vaccine like they have discovered, 
the first thing that they do is to apply for that protection. Now, they have monopoly over the vaccine for 20 years. If they have monopoly over the vaccine for 20 years, they set the price. Already we have seen, you know, we are talking about a range of $40, $50 uh, for a dose, and the dose is twice. So you can receive the first uh, injection, then you get the second injection. How many Ugandans are capable of, uh, um, you know, paying for that cost? It's a big problem. We have enabling frameworks at a country level. In Uganda, we spent the last 10 years uh, revamping our intellectual property laws to actually recognize the fact that even in situations where people have discovered uh, new innovations mm -hmm. like vaccines, these can still be made accessible to people at the cheapest price possible. The question is, how are we actualizing this and are we ready to actualize this? Some of the mechanisms which are existing, for instance, you can issue compulsory licenses. Uh, these compulsory licenses are very enabling to be able to work within the discovery that has been had, even before the 20-year period uh, expires. And we have this in our industrial uh, properties legislation. You can do parallel importation. If, if the vaccines are in the US, um, you can be able to, 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 to parallel import it into Uganda mm -hmm. without being held accountable. We have that legal framework that is existing. But, but I don't think it's the solution. The solution is in how much our infrastructure is actually capable of reverse engineering. I'll give you an example. In Italy, northern Italy, they have had issues with ventilators, um, which are now a hot cake. Everyone wants to receive it. And just um, uh, one of the components of the ventilators that is mostly needed to repair it was costing 11,000 US dollars. You know, that's a lot of money, almost 40 million Ugandan shillings to get that. Mm. Now, the owners who had patented uh, those ventilators were not actually permitting anyone to do a reverse engineering of that. Eventually, they were able to do a reverse engineering and get the same component at a cost of one dollar. Now, there is a suit against those that reverse engineered uh, this that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. in, in Netherlands, you know, they had laboratories, they had equipment, and they were buying this equipment from Roche. <coughs> now, Roche is the same supplier for the liquids that they do use in the laboratories. And Roche was not supplying uh, to the necessary amount that was needed. It actually took uh, the European Commission to intervene uh, to be able to force this company to produce. So there are a lot of issues that are involved in these diagnostics that we do have, that we do need. And the question is around our capacity. I'll never forget the study that we did a couple of years back on pharmaceutical manufacturing, where we had very few pharmaceutical manufacturers doing business, and even those that were there. One of the factory actually closed and decided to make biscuits and quencher <laughs> because it was much more profitable to be able to produce biscuits and quencher as opposed to pharmaceuticals. So th there is a real desire to support our scientists. Mm -hmm. There is a real desire to now support our pharmaceutical industries to be able to race, even if it means we have not actually you know, discovered, but if we are able to do the reverse engineering mm -hmm. of what has been discovered, I think it's going to be one of the magic bullets that will be important as we move towards uh, uh, realizing everyone's access to the vaccines. Wow. Yeah. And Dr. Driwale, you've arrived at a time where all the questions and the capacity building or infrastructure, the magic bullet that Mr. Mulumba is talking about are questions that you're going to have to answer. Let's welcome Dr. Driwale. A reminder, Dr. Driwale Alfred is the Assistant Commissioner, National Immunization Program, UNEPI from the Ministry of Health. And I would pray you kick off from the magic bullet that he's talking about and tell us what government is trying to do to address the question of access when it comes to these essential medicines and uh, diagnostics. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. The issue of vaccines um, is uh, what everybody else has been looking for, and waiting for, mm -hmm. because we are dealing with an, a pandemic that has taken toll on lives. 
Now, the, the global community, big economies, pharmaceutical companies, universities, and philanthropists, they pulled, um, they set an ambitious target to make diagnostics, to make vaccines, to make treatment. Now, when we talk about vaccines, now I, there is the COVAX facility, which has been made with the aim of partly addressing some of the concerns he has raised. Um, traditionally, making a vaccine would take 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the bottleneck has actually been the financing, financing the research and development and financing the production. Now, where we are dealing with a pandemic, no single company can meet the demand for vaccines. So with that in mind, the COVAX facility has been established upstream globally to pool resources uh, so that private sector can be supported to do research and development and also to support pharmaceutical companies to uh, increase production of vaccines which are made by other companies. So, for example, the Zeneca uh, uh, vaccine which they're developing, they're partnering with the, the Serum Institute of India. So, as we speak, there is a new terminology called production at risk. As the vaccines are still under research, because of the pooled resources, pharmaceutical companies are already producing these vaccines so that once a vaccine is confirmed to be safe and efficacious, its rollout is very fast. So now that is part one in terms of research, development, and production. Mm -hmm. Part two is a, a safeguard against um, against uh, what the Director General WHO calls uh, vaccine nationalism. That's exactly the abuse of rights where it would come. You are poor, you have no access. Yet the, the disease is ravaging and we all know nobody is safe until everybody is safe when you are dealing with a vaccine. So what the COVAX facility has also done is to ensure that the vaccines doses will be made available to countries at once, regardless of your ability to pay. You see, the vaccines are aimed at reducing death, not actually now controlling disease, so the, the spread of the disease. So in that way, the COVAX facility has an allocation framework that vaccines will be allocated. By the way, because of this pooling, we have over 360 vaccines under development. This is a rec world record. It has never happened before. And we are having a vaccine coming out in less than a year. This is also another record. And about 10 of these vaccines are in their last stage of, of research. So what is going to happen is the available, first available doses will be allocated to countries at 3% across board, 3% of your population, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, uh, vaccinate people who are in the front line. Because now this disease in Uganda is taking its toll on healthcare workers. That is a, a, a resource which has to be protected so that they look after others better with more confidence. Then after that, 17% will be allocated to people who are in ill health and people who are elderly, therefore the vulnerable group. That is phase two. Now, this, the, the goal is to make this 20% available at the cost of the global facility. So it means we would get it free. Our vulnerables will be protected at no cost, direct cost to us. Now, the, thereafter, the country will now have to buy vaccines to cover other, uh, other uh, population characteristics or to up to a level where we want 
we will set the coverage we want for herd immunity, for population immunity. Now, at that point, we will now have to focus on how to pool resources nationally. Is it from the uh, treasury? Is it through individual contribution? Is it through cost sharing? These proposals are still under development and they will be, uh, uh, they will be discussed and a lot of discussion is going to be around this. Now, in terms of how prepared we are. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Doctor, before you talk about how prepared we are, I want us to bring into uh, conversation Mr. Zane Rizvi, who is based in Washington, uh, D.C. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Mr. Zane, you had Dr. Driwali talking about the COVAX initiative, which now we can confirm that Uganda is part. But as far as more global opportunities are concerned and efforts to improve the access of the COVID-19 essential medicines and other therapeutics, we would want you to explore on that conversation. Good morning and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. I think, you know, the doctor has laid out very clearly the, the hope uh, of the COVAX facility and the COVAX initiative. Um, the COVAX initiative aims to procure 2 billion doses by the end of 2021. So because we know many of the vaccine candidates require two doses, that will be roughly one, uh, enough doses for 1 billion people uh, by the end of 2021. That is the hope. Um, Right now, the COVAX facility has procured 700 million doses um, of experimental vaccine candidates. Um, they have 300 million of the AstraZeneca vaccine candidate. They have 200 million from Serum Institute, which is, uh, might be interchangeable, either AstraZeneca or Novavax. And then finally, they have 200 million of the Sanofi uh, GSK candidate. I think you know, the COVAX facility is important, um, but as you note, um, it is one part of the many conversations that are going on globally. Um, some countries are um, looking to donate doses, provide doses. Um, the US government so far has not, you know, made any public statements about what it is doing globally, uh, but we hope and expect that the US government will take a leadership role. Um, one thing I think it's very important for your viewers to understand is that so much of these conversations are about how do we distribute the limited amount of vaccine that we have? Um, you know, how do we distribute um, the, a slice of, of, of the vaccine? Mm -hmm. But what we should be talking about as well is how do we make the pie bigger? Mm -hmm. How do we make more vaccine? How do we make more vaccine than we've ever made before as quickly as possible and get it to everyone in the world as quickly as possible? So one of these initiatives is, is the COVAX facility. Another initiative uh, at the World Health Organization is called the uh, Technology Access Pool, CTAP. Mm -hmm. And the idea of CTAP is that no one corporation can supply the world with diagnostics, therapeutics, or even a vaccine. No one corporation, no matter how large the corporation can supply the world. And so we need um, as many manufacturers as possible to be working on uh, producing these vital, vital uh, COVID-19 medical responses. Um, and so the CTAP uh, is a voluntary initiative in which uh, companies can share um, their intellectual property, uh, their know-how. Um, one way to think about it is they can come and share the recipe. You know, how do you make the diagnostic? How do you make the th therapy? How do you make the vaccine? And the idea behind CTAP is that if we get these uh, manufacturers, many who have taken billions and billions of uh, public dollars, mm -hmm. if we get these manufacturers to contribute to the public pool, to contribute to the public good, then we can rapidly scale up manufacturing all around the world. So that's one initiative 
um, that is, uh, you know, you can think of it as a sister initiative to CTEP, but it's more focused on expanding supply. Um, another initiative globally uh, is at the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization, India and South Africa, have proposed a waiver. Um, and the idea is there are certain trade rules uh, about patents, about, you know, uh, who can produce medicines and how. Um, and India and South Africa have proposed that for the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, we should not pay attention to these patents because there are more important things happening right now. And so this is an early, at, at the, the waiver is at an early stage, but the idea again is similar. The idea is um, equitable distribution is important, but how do we make uh, the vaccine pie bigger? How do we get as much vaccine? How do we get as much treatment? How do we get as much uh, as uh, many diagnostics as possible? Um, and I believe, um, you know, earlier in the conversation, someone made a very good point that we've actually already seen um, some of the negative consequences uh, of not working globally. Uh, we have seen how, uh, uh, you know, personal protective equipment or experimental treatments of remdesivir uh, were hoarded by a small number of countries. And unfortunately, it seems like some of the leading vaccine candidates have also been largely purchased by rich countries. Um, and so it raises really serious concerns about how will we ensure that everyone in the world gets access as quickly as possible? All right, so uh, Mr. Zane, before I bring these gentlemen back into the conversation, I would like you to maybe briefly talk about the, the request by India and South Africa more to the World Trade Organization. I think it's, it's happening this Friday. The likely possibility of 75% uh, of these countries accepting that these waivers should actually be removed, uh, talking about the IP rights, is it likely uh, to, be, to, to get a positive response? I think, it's an, I think it's an ambitious proposal, but I think it's also the beginning of a conversation. Um, I think it's very important for um, developing countries and middle-income countries and any country, really, who is not hoarding vaccine doses to speak up publicly mm -hmm. that this is not acceptable, um, that we should have the right uh, to produce any treatment vaccines or diagnostics, and we should not let uh, monopolies uh, and monopoly control uh, determine who gets access. Um, and so, you know, you can take a look at uh, the HIV crisis, for example, to see the, the devastating toll uh, that patent monopolies played in uh, increasing the price of, of vital, vital medicines. Um, in 1998, um, HIV medicines was uh, were $10,000 US. Um, and now HIV medicine is, you know, a few, a few cents. Uh, and the reason for that uh, is because we had many, many more producers coming in. We had much more competition. Uh, we had uh, as many producers making it um, as they wanted. And so there was a real uh, 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 effort uh, and we need, need a similar effort. Um, and so in 2001, during the you know, height of the HIV AIDS crisis, uh, the WTO did adopt uh, the Doha Declaration, uh, which was a similar type of statement that uh, you know, affirm the importance of public health. And so this waiver, in, in one sense, this latest waiver proposed by India and South Africa, uh, can be seen as a continuation of that tradition, uh, which is to say that it is an a, a important statement um, of uh, you know, whether or not it succeeds at this early stage. You know, I'm sure it will come back up uh, in the next few months. And it's, it's going to be a discussion that keeps happening, because until everyone gets access uh, people are going to ask questions about the, the system we have of making and delivering medicines. And, and I think it's really, really important to understand and underscore just how much public taxpayer dollar money from all around the world, actually, is mm -hmm. going into these medicines. Um, you know, it's tens of billions of dollars uh, have gone in, not from the private companies themselves, but actually from, uh, from, from, from the public all around the world. 
Well, thank you so much as I bring the gentleman back into conversation. You listened in to what Mr. Zain was saying, building the capacity of infrastructure, of manufacturing, and he was talking about the World Health Organization, if you should know, that it actually set up a voluntary mechanism to share coronavirus-related intellectual property rights, but no pharmaceutical company mm. has contributed to it yet. So I'll come back to you from the advocacy world and listening into what Mr. Zane was saying. What is more pronounced still when it comes to actually the barriers? I think, well, the, the world has been clear. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger countries have shown us, um, uh, the f big pharmaceutical companies have also shown their true values. And I think um, we need to come together uh, as Africa and improve manufacturing locally. It's good uh, the president of Uganda has come out himself and said we need to, to, to improve manufacturing here. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it would be good to have the f practical steps. Um, what we need to do then, uh, it was good news in the papers today, uh, local hubs are, being, are un undergoing trials mm -hmm. to ensure that these can be out to treat, treat COVID. That's a good step. Mm -hmm. There is need for support for that. There is need to support um, other countries that are doing the same in, in the region. How do we share information to improve our research will be very, very important. Mm -hmm. How do we um, improve or harmonize the regulatory component so that, you know, it takes a long time for when even this um, medicine or even vaccine is shown to be effective to when it will actually reach, be, be used. Mm -hmm. So we need to fast track that process. And therefore, uh, the drug regulatory agencies mm -hmm. need to come together to ensure that that happens. Mm -hmm. That will not also happen without uh, sufficient funding. So we also need, as countries, to pull. Um, Dr. Drewali has just said, well, we might get 20% of the vaccines we need mm -hmm. free of charge. It means we still have to pay for 80%. Mm -hmm. That requires financing. And therefore, uh, as a country and as countries in Africa, we need to come together and begin to also look internally mm -hmm. and say, where do we resource this research from? How do we share technology? How do we take advantage of the policy space? Mm -hmm. uh, Moses has talked about the, the flexibilities that allow us to manufacture even what is still patented. Mm -hmm. How do we take advantage of that? How do we take advantage of the COVAX facility, mm. of the, uh, the COVID um, tools accelerator pool that uh, is with WHO? So we need to um, get out and be more proactive to ensure that we can get access. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so if I bring you in, Mr. Mulumba, and to go back to Dr. <laughs> Diwali and talk about the reports of the clinical trials, if we were to boost the manufacturing, because actually that could save the situation and shorten the, the conversation if we're able to get our own vaccine here on local soil. And of course, what you're doing more to support our local manufacturers. Um, uh, the, the local initiatives towards vaccine development, I think the I'm not better suited to to give an update because it is the scientific committee mm -hmm. and the universities who are in that space. Um, number two, it's good and it's the right thing to do for us to have the local capacity to produce. But the, the issue at hand is that one, no one vaccine actually is uh, approved for use. So all these efforts we are doing, I would say, are somehow speculative because we are monitoring all these, I said 10 of them are already in, uh, in uh, uh, clinical trial stage three, mm -hmm. and uh, 47 are in different stages of human trials. 
So to, uh, to start investing, really you need to be sure what you are investing because the technologies are different, the platforms which you will need uh, to develop those vaccines are different. So you can only commit your resources when you are dealing with, for us, at, uh, at our level mm -hmm. as a country. That step will only make sense for us to make when we know that there is a vaccine which is efficacious, it is approved for use, then ours is to ac accelerate production. Lastly, I'm also aware that uh, investment in the pharmaceutical sector, especially vaccines, is very expensive. So it's a venture worthwhile uh, uh, trying, but I think given the, um, the economic situation we are in, it would be a little over ambitious at this stage. But what I know is partnerships are also uh, possible. So it means we will have to attract foreign investment and maybe provide concessions the way uh, we did with the quality chemicals where government had to make a commitment to ensure that the, the investment costs uh, are managed in a way that the, we, we can now manufacture our own ARVs. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, maybe my last comment on this is when, when medicines or vaccines are produced for the first time, the costs, as uh, earlier explained, are normally very high, very, very high. But with the time, as more partners come in and then the generic uh, pe people start going for the generic production through those permissions being sought, then the costs normally come down. But the bottom line is the pharmaceutical companies are not a charity. <laughs> their businesses. <laughs> they want to recoup all the money they put in, uh, in, uh, in research, in development, and then the capital they have put in production. I can tell you, last year, the, the, in the World Health Assembly, last year, that is 72, the World Health Organization floated a resolution for more transparency mm. on pricing of pharmaceutical uh, products and vaccines. And, uh, the, and, 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 and I can tell you, that is one of the resolutions which failed to go through. We, we sponsored that resolution as Uganda. We mm. co-sponsored. Mm. The, 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 it, it, it had no headway mm. because the the pharmaceutical lobby is very strong and they will not make that progress. And the partners who, who seem to spearhead issues around human resource and so on are the very ones who were blocking these uh, negotiations. So the time at head is, is, is tough. I think we, the, the, to invest is the way to go. Maybe the generic variants by attracting foreign investment and making concessions which uh, encourage that to happen in Uganda. Okay, so Dr. Later, probably my final question to you will be if we are prepared actually, because Dr. Chivida mentioned about the vaccines, the Pfizer one, which is a negative 80 uh, degrees actually for it to be kept. But before we answer the preparation question, you had, Mr. Mlumba, you had uh, Dr. Driwali saying that these pharmaceutical companies are not a charity. Yeah. Yet earlier, you also mentioned that, of course, the poor countries or the poor people will get access to these vaccines later. Yeah. So s specific to Uganda, d do you see us in this vacuum of where we're always, let's say, last in line to receive these vaccines? Because even in terms of capacity building, yeah. Dr. Said, we will have to get the foreign investment. Okay. Let's try to address from your perspective or maybe take advantage of the human rights or policies mm. that exist that we can take advantage of mm. and probably be within those on the first line. Thanks for the question. It's a very important one. And uh, 
First of all, I agree that international initiatives are important mm -hmm. and that enlarging the cake or, or the space on the number of vaccines is the way to go. For as long as that enlargement is done globally and not nationally, we are going to be in the same problems. Sustainability is in investing our own production, our own solutions here for vaccines. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the Pfizer discovery. It promises 1.6 billion doses, 1.1 million, 1.1 billion doses are bought off by the US and the UK. So no matter how much, you know, money will be there, initiatives will pull the money, but these vaccines will already be gone. Pfizer, the, the first response they made was against President Trump. When President Trump was happy and he, he was actually making a point that uh, the US government had supported Pfizer. Pfizer was so fast to actually deny the fact that they had used public resources <laughs> to make the vaccine. The, the, it's, not, it's not that it's not intentional. They are actually making a case that they have made private investments and as such, they are going to recoup private profits. So the lesson in that for us is... Is, is, is that it has to be here. Then also, Pfizer has totally refused to play around with intellectual property. Not even offer licenses. They are what they call voluntary licenses. When a person has a patent, they can give Uganda a voluntary license. They can give quite a chemicals if it has the capacity to manufacture a voluntary license to produce that vaccine. Pfizer is not willing. If we go back to the waiver, Uganda is an LDC. We don't need the waiver to go against the intellectual property uh, rights that everyone else is saying. Mm. South Africa, the one fronting, is bound by the trade rules. And India? India is bound by the trade rules. Mm. Uganda is not bound by the trade rules. In fact, if Quality Chemicals or any other pharmaceutical company was capable of doing productions, mm. we would already reverse engineer what Pfizer has done. So yes, the solutions are needed, but those are global solutions. The solutions here are more into what we are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the question of clinical trials. Yeah. They have already sanctioned many clinical trials, but I also don't want us to forget um, how much sometimes scientists have been insensitive in clinical trials. The legal frameworks on protection of citizens has to actually be very, very active. We are currently handling a case, a very interesting case, where a clinical trial was denying children oxygen deliberately because they are doing a scientific study. So these studies on vaccines, they are, they are, they are, they are important studies, but protocols have to be in place. Mm -hmm. As Dennis clearly highlighted, our immunization and vaccines program has been built around children. In 2017, we got a legislation and this legislation is very enabling. It, it establishes an immunization fund. Mm. It establishes you know, the right to receive vaccines. But it's working within an environment of children and vaccination. So all of that has to be revamped mm -hmm. moving forward. OK. Yeah. All right, so doctor, we want to understand and probably be content with the question of how prepared Uganda is. If we talk, uh, talk about the 20% you mentioned, that of the vac speculatively, I'll use your word, if it comes from the COVID, uh, COVAX Facility. initiative and we yeah. receive the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, are we prepared? For example, if it's the, the Pfizer that needs to be kept under the negative 80 degrees, do we have such equipment and, and in which hospitals anyway uh, do we even have such equipment that can be able to store these vaccines safely even the handling itself do we have well-trained professionals to be able to handle these vaccines um i can say two years ago when we vaccinated health workers along the congo uganda border we used the Ebola vaccine, which was minus 80 degrees. Mm. So it required a dedicated investment to do that. Now, if we are going to go for COVID vaccine, which is countrywide, mm. 
Mm -hmm. The vaccines are most likely going to be coming in phases, in smaller quantities, so we can model if we invest in cold chain, which is up to that degree, what is the best approach to the vaccination. So that becomes another issue. Mm -hmm. But what we also know is many vaccine options are going to be available to choose from. So you will have to choose what you are, you are capable of managing. If, you, if the infrastructure we have now is for holding vaccines between two to eight, of course, the, the chamber which holds up to minus 18, the volumes are small. So we will have to go for vaccine options, which we can afford. Because if we go for the minus 80, mm -hmm. then what it means is we will have to cut the budget which would have gone into, into purchasing vaccines. Mm -hmm. We'll put it in, in technology. So instead of getting 20%, we may drop to 10. So this is a choice which we will have to make. It's but a very hard one. Choice may not vary. Some of these vaccines, uh, patients might actually need two to three doses. Yet at the same time, there's a, a, a challenge when it comes to policing, right? Going back here to see and follow up that actually somebody got, an, got the first dose, then second or, or even third dose. Are there strategies so, in place yes. to so, manage this? Yes. Um, so maybe about the, our planning, we have established a national coordination committee which is putting um, a response and vaccine deployment plan. It is a multi-sectoral uh, committee. It consists of uh, uh, government uh, ministries, departments and agencies, civil society, mm -hmm. uh, development partners, NGOs, and the private sector. And uh, it keeps growing. And we have established subcommittees. There's a group which is working on the cold chain capacity and cold chain options mm -hmm. and the vaccine uh, variants and the doses phasing this. So there's a, a group which is working on that. We are also having a group which is working on the uh, capacity building of healthcare workers um, and training them, including supervision of this activity. Okay. We are also having a committee on monitoring and evaluation and post-vaccination um, uh, um, post surveillance. So this is where your technologies come. Because we know this is a vaccine we have to give, we don't want to leave room for dropouts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have technologies which can trace you. Uh, if you appeared today, you are given, then next time, when you are due, you are not there. We, are, we have resources to, this is something we are doing for routine immunization. Now we will use the same um, for COVID. It will remind you that you are due for your immunization. Okay. Uh, yes, and the person, healthcare manager near you will also be updated. So that we want to put a human face to this activity other than uh, statistics only. All right. Okay, so Dr. Jewali, uh, before I come back to you for your final remarks or even way forward, you should be reminded that Mr. Uh, Zain Rizvi, who is based in the UK, is on Skype. And as we conclude this uh, conversation, uh, please uh, talk to us about what you think the way forward towards all this conversation should be. As we await, because within one or two weeks, one of these vaccines that Dr. Driwale said we are speculating is going to actually get authorization. Yeah, I think it is, it is critical that we wait and see, you know, what the full data look like, you know, whether it's both safe and effective mm -hmm. and see whether the candidates indeed work out. Um, I think the way forward has to be based in solidarity. Um, and I think 
we have to understand this is the greatest global challenge we have seen in maybe the past 100 years um, when it comes to public health. It demands a response in which all of us, you know, all of us have an important role to play. Um, and I think all of us should use the authority we have, the voice we have, the power we have to require the pharmaceutical corporations to act in the public interest and not just for their commercial imperatives. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is very important for African countries to work together. And I think it's very important um, to follow up on the very important and bold statements that the African Union has put out about vaccine manufacturing, about intellectual property not being a barrier, and about uh, local production capacity. Um, I think, you know, I would encourage um, governments all around the world to really understand and elevate this issue because there is a different way. You know, none of this is uh, inevitable. These are all policy choices that uh, governments are making. And so we can make different ones. We can make better ones to increase access, not for just for this pandemic, but for medicines in the future as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, Mr. Zain Rizvi. He's a law and policy researcher, a public interest. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Back to you, Dr. Chibida. Dr. Driwari mentioned that no one is safe until everyone is safe. What would be your final remark? Well, my final remark would be um, to continue this discussion mm -hmm. about country preparedness. Yeah. Uh, to ensure also that uh, there is more community education. You've heard about the apathy. People do not think we actually have the virus in the country. <laughs> yeah. And so there is need to engage yeah. with the community. We still have, the numbers are not yet so bad as other countries, mm -hmm. but with the limited testing and with the community spread, there is a real danger. Mm -hmm. However, we have to prepare. I think uh, we need more investments in, in this area. We need to also think local, ensure that we take advantage of local manufacturing, mm -hmm. of this local research that is taking place, and to share knowledge with those that want to share. Okay. Yes. Community engagement, sensitization, support of our local manufacturers, Mr. Mulumba. Yeah, I, I think we need to, I agree with the point of solidarity, mm -hmm. but as part of solidarity, we should not just be consumers in the solidarity. We need to be, really be seen to be practicing um, these things we've talked about, okay. national preparedness. The waivers that we've applied for, in fact, just to let you know, the waiver was denied. Uh, the, the, the European Union opposed it, yeah. and, and it didn't go through with so other countries. So we shouldn't expect countries. any difference so, from so, there. So South here. Africa has actually asked that the conversation continues, but this waiver was, didn't, didn't make it. So, so we already have policy space in Uganda. We need to make use of it, but also continue the solidarity and be seen to change our systems. The, we may have all the medicines, but if we don't deal with the community components, of, of you know this phobia against uh, vaccines, um, in a couple of other things which are hampering um, systems to work at the national level, will certainly have problems. Okay, yeah. and you'll get the final say, Dr. Driwali, as we conclude. Um, I want to conclude on the note that um, even if we got a vaccine today, it will take more than one year to have a significant number of our population vaccinated, even if we have the money in our pocket. So that's because, 2022? Yes. 2022, even other preparedness models are moving up to 2023. Mm -hmm. So we need to do what we are best at, disease prevention. We are going to live with the masks longer. We will move with sanitizers longer and will maintain social distance longer. This is uh, against the backdrop that the numbers of cases we are seeing in country in severe form is not relenting. The numbers are increasing and COVID is real. So it's not a joking matter. Okay. So we'll have to do that. And then number two, 
Uh, the Immunization Act gives the Minister of Health um, the power to um, use, to authorize the use of a vaccine for containing a disease outbreak or against the risk of importing a disease. So we will put in, we, are, we will work with the legal teams in the Office of Solicitor General to ensure that the legal issues around possible vaccine uh, vaccination is, uh, is done um, um, uh, properly. Finally, the vaccines are going to be expensive. And um, we will leave all options, all options of uh, financing vaccines in the country open as long as we're able to regulate. Because we also do not want to see a situation where uh, people come into the country, they are vaccinating with anything, they are charging any price, and they're... so the, all these kind of arrangement um, is going to be part, is part of our preparation uh, framework. So that we contain, we minimize deaths. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Driwale Alfred. He is the Assistant Commissioner, Uganda National Expanded Program Immunization, UNEPI, from the Ministry of Health. And of course, I do thank you, gentlemen, Dr. Dennis Chibida, the Executive Director, Coalition for Health Promotion and Social Development, commonly known as HAPS, Uganda Leading NGO in Advocating for Equitable Distribution of Essential Medicines in Uganda. And Mr. Moses Mulumba, Executive Director, SEHAD, the Center for Health, uh, in uh, the Center for Health, Human Rights and uh, Development. Thank you so much, gentlemen, Thank you. Thank for you. this uh, conversation. And like I said at the beginning of this important program, I never take it for granted that you watch NBS uh, television. Well, we'll say good evening to you, Mr. Zain uh, Ridzi who is also based in Washington, D.C. We never take you for granted that you watch NBS television because today, given the COVID-19 times, the access comes at a cost. But you are a wonderful audience for always keeping it here. Our normal programming continues. My name is Mebo Twegumiezake. <laughs>